Kristen Atchison here. We're still talking about Chapter 10, The Auditory Brain and, perce and Perceiving Auditory Scenes. Um, we are talking about this, we're on the second video lecture, Localizing Sounds. So localizing sounds is about being able to figure out the source of the sound because it really is important to our action, right? So if somebody's talking, we need to know who's talking. Um, we need to be able to find out where that sound is so that we can direct our actions towards that situation. And we talked about the brain being, um, the auditory cortex being organized tonotopically because the cochlea and the basal membrane were organized tonotopically. Um, and so this tonotopic um, organization in the cochlea um, really helps us with frequency location. That's really helpful for us. But it doesn't give us any bit of look of good for spatial location. So for figuring out where those sounds are coming from, um, we've really evolved some pretty exquisitely sensitive, and I love how your book says that, um, figuring out where sounds are because of the two ears. Um, so because we have two ears, we can use that information um, to kind of figure out where sounds are. Um, so first we're going to talk about kind of the terms that we use to talk about where sounds are in our space. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of how the brain is using the information, how the brain processes that information of where um, given this various um, things. So how we perceive sounds is kind of in this um, 3D space, right? Because we were in 3D space. Um, and so there's three dimensions that we're going to talk about. Um, the first is kind of the horizontal plane. Um, and that's what we call um, azimuth. And it refers to the left-right location of a sound. And the way you can remember that azimuth is the left-right one, the horizontal plane, um, is that we read horizontally. We read left to right. Um, and so you can use that kind of to help remember that that's the one we're talking about on the horizontal plane. Um, so again, this information moves um, either right or left in our plane. Elevation um, is the second dimension. Um, and that second dimension is, is the sound above us or is the sound below us? Um, and so again, it, this is talking about kind of um, where the sound is coming from in a vertical sense. So is the sound again above us? Is the sound below us? Where's the sound coming from? And the third dimension that we talk about in localizing sounds um, is distance. Um, and distance is how far that sound source is from your head in any direction. So is it really, really close or is it really, really far away um, is that third dimension of distance. Um, so those are the three dimensions that we talk about um, in and we use to localize sound, the three different dimensions. And we process them differently. So for azimuth, um, one of the ways that we process sounds um, is kind of the difference between we get from one ear to the other, okay? Um, and one of the ways, that, one of the features that's important in this is something called acoustic shadow. And acoustic shadow is the idea that your head blocks sound. So it sounds really big and like acoustic shadow, that's, what is, what is that? Really it means is if a sound's coming from your left side, your left ear's gonna hear it really, really well. Uh, but your head is thick, <laughs> and so your head is going to block some of that sound from your right ear. Um, and so in this image, um, kind of the purple sections are that acoustic shadow, um, where that information is not um, as, um, there's, there's not as much information. Um, it kind of blocks some of those sound waves um, from that. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Your brain can use that. We can use that for localizing sounds, for figuring out where a sound is coming in terms of azimuth. So um, one of the ways we do this is interaural level differences, okay? Um, so that refers to the difference um, on the sound level. So kind of think about loudness, right, or amplitude at the two ears. Okay, so this is saying, okay, well, this ear thought it was a little bit louder, the left ear thought it was a little bit louder than the right ear, so this must be coming from the left side, because the left ear thought it was louder than the right ear. Um, and so again, the closer that sound source is to that ear, the, the bigger 
um, that sound's going to seem. And again, the further away that um, that ear is from that sound, the farther it's going to be. And so the difference between how your two ears, the information your two ears are receiving um, is this interaural level difference, this ILD. And this will be used um, by your brain to figure out this azimuth. So here's an image that kind of shows you that. So these ILDs um, work best at frequencies greater than 1,000 hertz um, because it's just easier um, that the head really attenuates the sound at the, um, at the far ear. Okay, so here's an image that kind of breaks this down. Um, so these little speakers you see around this guy's head um, are taught, and these degrees are talking about azimuth, okay? That's, the, that's that plane we're operating on. We're just working on this horizontal plane around the head. Okay, so are you um, zero degrees is the speaker is right in front of you. 180 degrees is the speaker is right behind you. 90 degrees is that speaker is right in, in a direct line to your ear. Okay, and you can see at 90 degrees on this um, graph, we are doing <laughs> the best um, in terms of inner all difference. It's going to be the greatest Inner aural, inner aural difference, the greatest ILD, um, because that means if that speaker is right at your right ear, then it's going to be the biggest difference from your left ear because of that acoustic shadow. Okay, so it's one speaker is going straight into one ear. That second ear is going to lose more, the most information because you're of that acoustic shadow because your head is blocking it. So it's going to create the biggest difference. Um, and you can see that on this graph. We, it's kind of the biggest right there. Um, and then we see, you know, at the 120s, 160s, we can kind of the 60s, 120s, 150s, we can see kind of these differences. So again, the ILD is greatest when the source is directly opposite one of your ears and non-existent when it's either in front of you or behind you. So if you look at both zero and 180 degrees on this graph, they're like identical, right? They're like right there at zero. There's not a difference because that information is going equally into your left ear and your right ear when it's the speakers in front of you. And when the speakers behind, directly behind you at 180 degrees, those sound is going equally into your left ear and your right ear. And so that's gonna tell you that it's either in front of you or behind you, okay? So again, we have um, non-existent um, at either directly in front of you or directly behind you, um, and the greatest when it's pointing at one ear, because that other ear um, loses a lot of information um, because of that acoustic shadow. But, but that acoustic shadow gives your brain information about localizing sounds. Okay. So the next piece that we're going to talk about, we talked about ILD. Now we're going to talk about ITD, interaural time difference. And interaural just means between the two ears, okay? So it's a big word, but it's just talking about um, there's two ears. How does we tell the difference between the information coming from the two ears? Um, so ILD um, was talking about the sound level the level differences. ITD is talking about the time differences, okay? Um, and so ITD gives us information about localizing sounds in terms of azimuth um, because distances, because of the distance of the sound, will be different too, okay? So at this speaker source at 45 degrees right azimuth, we'll see that that um, right ear is going to get the information faster than that left ear is, okay? And so that is interaural time difference, okay? That the fact that they're getting the information at different times. Sound needs to travel farther to get to an ear. There's a delay in that neural response, which gives information about where that sound source is. It gives information about that localization, and any locations that yield about the same intensity um, and time information will not be identifiable, di identifiable without head movement, okay? So if we're giving, um, if we're getting information about that saying, okay, the time was the same, um, the intensity was the same, um, you, if you don't move your head, you're not going to be able to figure it out, okay? So when we all, we all are trying to hear something and we do that head tilt, 
Um, that's because we're trying to get more information. Where is that sound coming from? And so we tilt our heads to kind of change that information to move our ears so that our brain can pick up on differences um, in azimuth. Um, we can see that here in this graph um, where we see um, the ITD um, is greatest um, at 90 degrees, okay? So again, when that speaker is pointed at your right ear, it takes the longest to get to your left ear, okay? Because it's got to go, not only are you not getting as much information because of acoustic shadow, but it's got to travel through your whole, around your whole head um, to even get in to that left ear. Um, so we'll see that that ITD is the longest, again, at 90 degrees. And just like we saw ILD, um, being zero um, at zero degrees right in front of your head or 180 degrees right behind your head, the same thing is happening here, okay? So there's, again, and this is where we'll hit that cone of confusion. Um, is it right in front of me? Is it right behind me? So these ILDs and ITDs really work together to provide information about the location of a sound in the horizontal plane, a location of sound on the plane of azimuth. Okay, so that cone of confusion are those locations, again, that are yielding the same intensity information um, and the same time information. Um, and this is really kind of, uh, there's an access of cone of information from that. Um, and it's called the cone of confusion. The other thing that we see um, is that again, head tilting. So if it's right in front of you, um, and that information is right in front of you, um, and this is, you don't see the speaker. You don't know the sound is coming from right in front of you or right behind you. You don't know because you're getting I equal ILD and equal ITD, um, whether it's right in front of you or right behind you, you tilt your head. And then, um, if it's right in front of you and you tilt your head to the left, so sit down, you know, the computer's in front of you um, or your phone or whatever you're watching this on is right in front of you. Um, and so this speaker theoretically is right in front of you, okay? Um, so tilt your head to the left and now the sound from the speaker is going into your right ear, okay? First, that's gonna give it both ILD differences and ITD differences. Now look back at the computer or the screen. Now tilt your head to the right. And that information is going to go into your right ear first, I mean your left ear first. Um, and so you're gonna be getting differences of ILD and ITD. So again, tilting that head um, is a way that we can also help localize sound when we're getting ambiguous information, um, if the sound source is really indirectly in front of us or directly behind us. Again, the reason that's ambiguous is because those ILD and ITD are exactly the same. Um, and so, we can make them unequal by moving our heads um, so that that information is um, changing the ILD and changing the ITD. Okay, so that ends our conversation about the horizontal plane, azimuth. Next, we're gonna talk about elevation. So elevation is pretty much exclusively done by your outer ear. It's almost exclusively done um, by the pina. Um, and really what it does is it gives us information um, about kind of this elevation um, in terms of a spectral shape cue. You don't need to understand the sh spectral shape cue. Um, what's important to know um, is really that that's that the outer ear is doing the work, that that pina is doing the work. Um, and remember when I said this has helped to locate sound, it's being helped to locate sound in terms of elevation. Um, is it above you or is it below you? Um, these spectral shape cues depend on, he on, uh, depend on hearing how the pina modifies the shape and sound across the entire spectrum. So those sound waves are not just going straight into your ear, they're hitting your pina too. Um, and that will modify that sound and will give you information again about, about whether it's above or below. The last dimension we're gonna talk about is distance. Um, that's again, how far or how close a sound source is. Um, and there's different ways that we do this that um, to perceive distance, the inverse square law, which we're really not gonna talk about 
we will talk about echoes and we will talk about Doppler effects. So first let's talk about the Doppler effect. Um, so here's a video that shows you what the Doppler effect is um, and explains it. The Doppler effect. In Sheldon's words, it's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. The Doppler effect is perhaps best explained visually. So here's a thing that is emitting waves. It could be a fire truck emitting sound, it could be a star emitting light, it could be a duck creating ripples on a pond. Those are all waves, and they all look something like this. We see the Doppler effect happening when the thing that is emitting waves moves. In the direction it's moving, the wave fronts bunch up, and behind it, they spread out. If our object is moving towards a stationary observer, these bunched up waves are observed at a high frequency, and if the object is moving away from a stationary observer, the waves are observed at a lower frequency. So that is the Doppler effect, the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. It makes sense but it gets interesting when you consider some of its applications. So let's say you are standing in the middle of a road. That's, that's you. And a car drives past you very fast. As it does so, it honks its horn, because you're standing in the middle of the road. The horn to you might sound something like this. So it starts at a high pitch and moves to a lower pitch, even though from the driver's perspective, the horn is playing the same pitch the entire time. So what's going on? As the vehicle's coming towards you, the sound waves that it's emitting bunch up, and so are delivered to you at a higher frequency, which you interpret as a higher pitch, because the frequency of sound waves is pitch. And then when the vehicle passes you and is moving away from you, the sound waves spread out, and so you hear them at a lower frequency, a lower pitch. This Doppler effect you can see was well demonstrated in this, and I'm, I'm guessing Sheldon's costume, what he was the Doppler effect, um, but um, and with his little shimmy there at the end. Um, but this doesn't necessarily tell you where, how close or how far something is, um, but it does, this change in loudness, um, this change in frequency does tell you whether the source is approaching or receding. So it's still providing information about distance, even if it's not giving you exact location about distance. Another way that we do this is echolocation. And you're like, wait, we're not bats. Um, you're right, bats do echolocation. Dolphins do echolocation. They are kind of the one animals that, mammals that we think do it most. Um, sound, and echolocation is just sound localization based on emitting sounds and then processing the echoes um, back to determine the nature of this. Um, bats really, they emit this really high frequency sound um, and then are tracking that um, to be able to determine where things are um, in the darkness. Humans do this too, only we just do it to judge the distance from objects, okay? Um, and in fact, we, um, I'm gonna show you a video where there's an individual who's blind um, and he actually makes clicking noises um, to really judge how far did things are away from him. And so we all use echolocation. We're just using it on a much lower um, kind of standard um, than what we think about, okay? But we're all still using it to help us judge distances. At first glance, this may seem like an ordinary man out for an ordinary bike ride. But look and listen a little more closely. Daniel Kish is completely blind. In fact, he doesn't even have eyes, save for prosthetic ones. Daniel has never seen a tree, a car, or even the bicycle he's riding. So how does he know where he's going? Or how to avoid oncoming traffic? The answer can be found in the clicking sound you hear. It's called echolocation. Bats use it to fly around in the dark, and dolphins use it to navigate the oceans. Daniel uses echolocation, or sound, to see. Every environment has its own acoustical signature. Every surface has its own acoustical signature. Daniel was born with an aggressive form of eye cancer called retinal blastoma. By the time he was 13 months old, both of his eyes were removed. You're 45. So you lost your sight at such a young age. 
you don't have any any memory of vision. I have no memories at all. Oh, I was using echolocation from the age of two or, or younger, but I really didn't know that much about it. It was just how you, how you adapted to your environment without really understanding it? Yes, I doubt very seriously that most sighted people give much thought or attention about how they see. So I really didn't give much thought or attention about how I see. Daniel uses echolocation to ride his bike. Cook. Is this a dish that you normally cook, Daniel, no, or are you no. experimenting this is with total, me? This is a total experiment. <laughs> and even hike alone in the mountains. Using sound to see can be a hard concept for a sighted person to understand. But Daniel will tell you, he sees his environment as a series of images created in his mind based on what he hears using echolocation. So you're calling out into the environment, you're essentially asking the environment, what are you and where are you, and you're receiving those answers. So you're getting an image and in your mind. Yes, I definitely get uh, three-dimensional images with depth and character and richness. And I can process those, and I can interact with those. From his modest bungalow in Long Beach, Daniel runs a small nonprofit called World Access for the Blind. So you can see and you could hear that he was making a clicking noise. He was using the fact that we use echolocation already. We don't always, you heard him, he, like, he, he didn't know he was necessarily using it. He just did it, right? These Our sensory systems aren't something that's always happening in a top-down manner. Most of the time it's happening bottom up. So he wasn't necessarily aware that he was using more echolocation than the rest of us were. Um, but um, he really said was using that. He was making these clicking sounds um, to get information. So we still, even um, the sighted, even those of us who don't have exceptional echolocation like Daniel does, um, still are using echolocation for us to determine distance. Um, the next we're going to talk about um, kind of starting to integrate um, some of these senses back together. So again, we talked about vision by itself and we've talked about audition by itself. Um, now we're going to start to kind of put those things back together. Um, so the ventriloquism effect is a form of visual capture. And what's happening there is um, when visual and auditory information conflict, the visual information is going to take precedence. Okay, so the brain's going to say, eh, vision trumps sound, um, vision's going to take place. Um, and we all experience the ventriloquism effect in our everyday lives. So here's another video that kind of shows you different situations where we um, are experiencing this ventriloquism effect. Um, and again, vision takes preference. The ventriloquism effect is an effect that is particularly interesting because it's one that we experience in our everyday lives. Crunchy wheat, nicely sweet. Crunchy wheat. In a ventriloquism effect, you see something and you hear something, and these two things are located at separate spatial locations, but they happen at the same time. So we experience this in the cinema, where the loudspeakers are um, located around the cinema screen. It seems to us that the speech that we're hearing is coming from the mouth of the actor on the screen. You're talking to me? Well, then who the hell else are you talking? You're talking to me? Well, one of the things that we can, can conclude is that the sensory systems influence each other. So the visual system influences the auditory system, influence the, the fact that there's processing in the visual system influences where we hear something to come from. Orson apologizes. I do not. You do too. Hey, stop putting words in line now. <laughs> All our experiences are multimodal, or the normal case of our, our perceiving the world is to be having multimodal experiences. And it's only in the rare cases that we're just seeing or just hearing just touching things, just tasting, and so on. Mm -hmm. This kind of research is important and it has impact beyond um, academia, beyond philosophy, beyond experimental psychology for things like the judicial process, whether we can be trusted to report what we've seen. If our experiences aren't the way we take them to be, then this might have some kind of implications for things like that. 
So even when you were watching her speak, um, that was the ventriloquism effect happening. Um, it seemed like that sound was coming out of her mouth. It wasn't. It was coming out of your speakers. Um, but again, that visual information is going to take precedence. Um, and so you're not going to localize those sounds to the speakers. You're going to localize that sound to her mouth. Um, because of this ventriloquism effect, this um, idea that, again, the visual system is going to take precedence. And this is happening in what you heard her talking about, these multimodal situations. Um, so multimodal mode means kind of different, in this sense, it means the different senses. We have different senses. And a multimodal experience would be you're getting information from multiple modes of perception. Um, so in the case of watching her talk, you were getting information from your visual mode and you were getting information from your auditory mode. Um, Whereas um, you can also get, there's other, uh, all of the perceptions can be integrated together um, as well. Um, and, but when we mix vision and sound, vision is going to trump sound. Um, and again, that will give us that, that ventriloquism effect. Um, things that need to happen for this ventriloquism effect to take place, um, the visual information should occur just before, before the auditory information. Um, so you're getting that just before. Um, and it needs to make um, these sense that these things are being linked, okay? So if, if it doesn't, your brain wants to go with the simplest solution, right? So if it doesn't make sense that these sounds coming from there, it it's going to not be as likely that you're going to have this effect. Like, no, she can't make that foghorn sound. Um, that's not the sound a human makes. Um, events really need to make sense. Um, and they have to be physically close in the environment. Um, so if I'm watching this video of her talk, but the speakers for my thing are in the other room, um, I'm not going to perceive that it's her talking. Uh, I'm not going to get this ventrilo ventriloquism effect um, because they're, they're not physically close in the environment. Okay, so we talked a lot about um, localizing sounds. Where in the brain is localizing sounds happening? Um, we talked about the um, superior olivory complex. In this is something that we call the medial superior olive. Um, and this is what we think um, is processing this information about the time differences. And um, we think that that's the area that this is happening. Again, the level of information that we have about the auditory system is much lower than the level of information we have about the visual system. Um, so this is where we think is happening. Um, as again, as I discussed in the required reading, you are not required um, to understand how these MSO neurons are doing this. Um, just that it is that MSO in the SOC that is really doing this um, process for us. Okay, this ends our conversation about localizing sounds. Thanks.